All right, looks like everyone's seated and ready to go. So um, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Coastal Sharks Management Board. Um, my name is Bob Beal. I am the uh, once again the stand-in chair for this meeting. Mel Bell, unfortunately, is not able to be here, as I mentioned yesterday during the Menhaden meeting. But Mel is online. If he has any comments, I will we'll acknowledge him for sure. And uh, Erica Burgess from Florida is the vice chair of this board, and she's not here today. Hannah Hart is her proxy. So uh, since neither the chair or the vice chair are here, I will be chairing this meeting. So with that, we'll jump right into it. Um, Everyone has been provided an agenda in the supplemental materials that were sent around and are on the Commission's website. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda that is uh, provided in the supplemental material? <laughs> Seeing no hands, we'll uh, have that agenda approved by consent. And essentially the same question for the proceedings from October of 2021. So it's been a little while since this management board has gotten together. Um, but the, the proceedings were on the briefing materials. Any changes or adjustments to the proceedings of any sort? All right, seeing none, uh, the proceedings from October of 2021 stand approved. That brings us to public comment. Um, is there any public comment on items that are not included on the agenda? Pretty small crowd in the back of the room and no hands are up, so. Uh, no public comment that I can see, and we, you know, if needed, we'll, we'll provide the opportunity to uh, have public comment later in the meeting. Um, with that, I think we'll jump into agenda item number four, which is the uh, consideration of zero retention or closure of the shark fin mako fishery. And uh, Carol Brewster Geist from NOAA Fisheries is here, and she's going to give a, a presentation on the background of that. So um, whenever you're ready to go, Carol, it's all yours. Thank you. Glad to see you. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be here and to see everybody and hello to everybody online. So I'm here today to talk about our proposed rule on short fin mako sharks. Next slide, please. I'll give you a little bit of the background and why we're doing this and the request for public comments. Usually when I come, our rules have already closed public comment, but in this case, we are still open. So I'm looking forward to whatever comments all of you have. Next slide, please. So this proposed rule is a reaction to ICATS, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna recommendation on short Fimeco that came out of the November 2021 meeting. If you remember, ICAT recommendations are binding. They are not voluntary. So we, we are required to implement their recommendation and that's what we're doing through this proposed rule. Um, our current uh, regulations are not quite as restrictive as the current ICAT recommendation. So a little bit of, next slide please, a little bit of a reminder about what ICAT has done over the past few years regarding short fin mako. In 2017, ICAT assessed short fin mako and found that they are overfished and experiencing overfishing and that significant reductions are needing, needed in mortality in order to even begin rebuilding the stock. In 2019, um, they updated that 2017 assessment uh, and found that even more reductions were needed than thought and recommended that ICAT adopt a non-retention policy to accelerate the rate of recovery. In 2019, ICAT also adopted recommendation 1906 to maintain the measures in 1708, that was that 2017 recommendation, and called for additional measures to establish the rebuilding plan. So that is what ICAT looked at in 2021. Next slide, please. And the following one. Sorry about that. So 2109, ICAT recommendation 2109 um, prohibits the retention of short fin mako in 2022 and 2023. It looks at whether or not there could be an allowance for limited retention after 2023 if fishing mortality across all nations is reduced below 250 metric tons. 
fishing mortality is all landings, all dead discards across all fisheries. SRS will be looking to uh, confirm how to calculate that 250 metric tons at its upcoming meetings. ICAT recommendation 2109 also included additional measures such as minimum standards for handling and release of shortfin micos, improving data and scientific research <laughs> on mating, cooking, nursing grounds, um, and also looking at whether or not the minimum sizes we have in effect now are effective at reducing mortality. Next slide, please. I'm now going to remind you, all of you, what we did, we being the United States, in response to the, the previous ICAT recommendations. So in 2018, after the, stock assess, the 2017 stock assessment, we took emergency action where we prohibited the retention of any live shortfin mako on commercial vessels, and we also established a recreational minimum size of 83 inches. In 2019, we proposed and finalized Amendment 11, and that changed things a little bit. That did continue the commercial measures of no live retention. Pelagic longline vessels need to have electronic monitoring or videos to confirm that they are not retaining any live shortfin mako. And then recreationally, we separated the minimum size into 71 inches fork length for males and 83 inches fork length for females. We also expanded the circle hook requirement. And if you all remember, it was when we had Amendment 11 proposed that this body considered and then adopted Addendum 5 that allows for this body to make quick changes to minimum sizes and retention limits. Next slide, please. So before, sorry, previous slide. There we go, that one. Thank you. Um, previously, before the 2017 stock assessment, U.S. catch across the entire Atlantic Basin represented approximately 14% of the total catch. By 2020, as a result of the measures in Amendment 11, we reduced that percentage to 3%, and our U.S. catch and fishing mortality was reduced 90% from our 2013 to 2017 average. In other words, we did a really great job reducing our shortfin mako mortality. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, that was not enough, and ICAT has now has a new recommendation, as I said, 2109, no retention for 2022 and 2023. We are proposing an alternative that would provide a flexible Mako shark retention limit with a default limit of zero across the commercial and the recreational fisheries. After 2023, if ICAT determines that some retention is allowed, we could increase that retention limit the retention limit would, ret would apply to all HMS permit holders, recreational and commercial, and all the existing prohibitions on other commercial gears would remain. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So during the fishing year, we could increase that retention limit once ICAT tells us that we have that ability, or we could subsequently decrease it. It all depends upon how how catch rates are going. We are not setting an upper limit. We aren't setting what that retention limit would be above zero. It could be moving to one fish per person. If there's enough retention, it could be one per person per year. It, it really depends upon how much mortality ICAT tells us we are allowed. Research of shortfin mako sharks would continue it, whether or not we allow researchers to retain dead shortfin makos would be done on a case-by-case -case basis, similarly to how we handle dusky sharks. Our preference is non-lethal sampling only. 
Next slide, please. We did look at two other alternatives. One was keeping our no action or status quo measures from Amendment 11. Um, we determined that that was not consistent with ICAT recommendation 2109. We also looked at whether or not we should prohibit short fin mako sharks entirely and decided that also was not consistent with the ICAT recommendation because the ICAT recommendation does allow for retention at some point in the, the future. Next slide. So we are, we are in the middle of the comment period. It closes next week on May 11th. We intend to publish the final rule in June that is when the entry into force date comes into, into effect from ICAT. And ICAT is going to be holding additional meetings to, determine, to test and determine the appropriateness of the additional measures in Recommendation 2109. Next slide. And so that brings me to the end. You're, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. If you have questions after the meeting, feel free to reach out to Carrie Sultanoff or Guy De Beck of my staff. And you can always submit comments at the, the web pages noted. Thank you. Great. Thank you, for, Carol, for the presentation. And are there questions on the ICAT decision or NOAA's proposed rule in response to that? Uh, John Clark and then Mike Luisi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Carol. I'm just curious if the U.S. is only 3% of the uh, take of mako sharks now. Where is most of the catch coming from, and are those countries going to enforce the uh, this retention ban? The uh, the negotiations at ICAT were quite fierce last November, where you had a number of countries, such as Canada, that have already banned the retention of shortfin makos, and then countries such as the U.S. and the E.U. that still allow for retention. Um, it was negotiations between all of these countries and Japan that led us to the, the prohibition of retention. Um, and it's, there are a lot of countries in ICAT. I would just say that the E.U. had a number of those, those landings just like the U.S. did um, and the countries within the EU and Japan. Do you anticipate that enforcement will be good in the EU? That is the hope. ICAT does have its compliance committee that looks at whether or not countries are following the recommendations. Mike Luisi, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks for the presentation, Carol. Uh, I had the opportunity, gosh, it's probably four or five years ago now, uh, to spend a couple weeks at an ICAP meeting, and I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was uh, it was mind blowing, and I guess my my questioning is kind of along the lines of John's. You know, I feel like when the recommendation comes out of ICAT, the United States takes serious and swift action. But I got the sense during during the discussions that we were having at that meeting that there really isn't anybody being held to the fire, I guess, uh, for compliance. I mean, there's a compliance committee. I, I understand that. But um, it just, it's concerning that, as John mentioned, you know, we have a small, we're a small fraction of, of the mortality and we take these measures, which are, it's responsible to take the measures. Um, I just hope that in your work with, with ICAT, um, that we can really try to come up with a way to, you know, hold people accountable, hold other countries accountable for what those recommendations are. That's, that's my comment. Thank you. Thanks. I had Jim Gilmore, then Jason McMee, then Tom Fody. <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman, and, and thanks, Carol. That's a great presentation. Um, so the the rule, and and even for ICANN, for is essentially a retention rule. Is there anything uh, in there about targeting, or is it just simply retention? Because there's no retention allowed, it doesn't really get into targeting. 
although it does make it very clear that even once retention is allowed, it will be retention only of dead shortfin makos, that there will be no retention of live shortfin makos. Um, the, the measures implemented in the recommendation also strengthen a lot of those data reporting requirements, so hopefully that will address some of the, the compliance issues that we've had. Jim, you're all set. All right, uh, Jason McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> and thank you for the um, for the presentation. I, my question is on the so it's being reevaluated. Seems like a, a short um, amount of time. So I'm wondering if there's going to be enough information to to make sort of a judgment in 2023. Um, that's different, or can we assume that? And I'm supportive of this, by the way, but just uh, wondering, you know, if we can sort of assume that this will persist um, probably past 2023. I will tentatively say yes, that I expect that it is unlikely all the countries will arrive at a point where all mortality from any catches is below 250 metric tons as soon as 2024. There is going to be another stock assessment, I want to say, in 2024. Um, so we will have more information at that point. But SCRS has committed to looking at all the data that's coming in and also trying to determine if the minimum sizes that we have currently in place would would be effective or if there are other measures effective in reducing mortality of makos once they're caught. Thanks, Carol. And uh, Tom Fody, and then I'll go to Doug Hamans. I was a little confused what you said, Carl, because I understood you said both the recreational and the commercial would be able if they reduce, they allow us to have a bycatch. But the recreational always lands live. So that means they will never be allowed to have a bycatch. It'll be commercial. I got a second question after that, if you want to answer that one first. I'll answer that one first. So yes, the recommendation currently is dead only once retention is allowed. But ICAT will be looking at those minimum sizes. And if they find that the minimum sizes are effective, then there is that possibility for live retention. Okay, my second question is, what are the land landings of the, do you have, does ICAT have any estimate of what the landings are by the non-members of countries of I, that are not members of ICAT, what their landing of short fins are? I do not have the answer to that one. Because I will get back to you. My, my, my thought is that most of the countries that are in involved in ICAT are the ones landing. There aren't that many. I, I think of a couple, maybe it's changed over the last couple, but there was a lot of countries that were landing all kinds of things, and they weren't members of ICAT, and they were actually landing in those countries because they could get aware we were not landing in ICAT countries. And I don't know if there's any way of recording those numbers and what the actual losses bit is. I'm sorry, I wasn't speaking into the microphone. Did everybody hear me? Okay, thank you. Tom, you all set? Carol, Carol, set. Okay, um, Mr. Hamans, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Carol, um, I, I, not to speak for everybody, but I, I certainly am just going to echo the fact that it's very disappointing that you know we just made regulations and the process we go through in the states, and now we have this. Um, but more so, because this is controlled through the HMS permit, at least on the recreational side, is there really anything that some of us states need to do? I mean, if we've already got in place the, uh, the uh, Amendment 11 or whatever it was, the 83-inch um, limit, right? And, I mean, because you said there's obviously a difference between the prohibited and retention, right? Do I really need to do anything if HMS permit's going to control it? Thank you for that question. The answer is yes. There are a number of states that do not require HMS permits in order to go fishing for sharks in state waters. And while... It is rare that such a state water fisherman fishing in state waters would catch a short fin mako. It is not impossible for one 
to land a short fin mako. And that would have repercussions for the United States. In a short follow-up, what are those repercussions? The United States would be found out of compliance with ICAT, which would mean possibly trade restrictions for U.S. fish or additional measures against us. All right, thanks. Other, uh, Hannah, do you have your hand up? Hannah Hart, please. Yeah, I guess just to follow up to that, is this something that we could consider de minimis for um, on a species level, um, given that, you know, landings in state waters, especially recreationally, are probably uh, very few and far between, and I don't know that we can disperse that MRIP data out. <clears throat> I'm just curious if that could be something we could consider. Uh, ICAT doesn't have a de minimis standing. All right. Uh, any other hands around the table in the room? Yeah, Got one online. Uh, Lewis Gillingham, go ahead, please. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Carol, for the presentation this morning. I, I think it inadvertently you, you answered my initial question, which was that 250 metric ton, ton threshold is for all 50 odd people or countries involved, not just the US. Um, and then I would just remind, and it's going around, when we did this back in 2019, the major concern was exactly what's being expressed now, that uh, are the other countries gonna follow suit where with the size limits, we've almost essentially shut down the recreational fishery. I, I, I think people are afraid to keep a mako period because they're they don't want to handle those bigger fish plus uh they're not sure they can identify the males from females i i, I think it's almost gone to to zero so that's been very effective and that's oh, thank you great thanks lewis other comments or questions i oh, got a couple of hands online um Lewis, your hand is still up. I think that's just left over. And then uh, Bill Gorham. Go ahead, please, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there currently any countries that are out of compliance or have been warned that they will be out of compliance in reference um, to this fishery? It seems like there's some resistance from other countries to follow suit with the drastic reduction um, while the United States leads with only 3% and a 90% reduction from when first asked. Um, when you talk to fishermen, you kind of like to hear the light at the end of the tunnel. And it doesn't appear to be possible without the um, action of other countries. Thank you. So at this point, there are no countries that have been found out of compliance with recommendation 1906 for, for ICAT, which does allow for some retention of MAKOs. Thanks, Carol. All right, um, that's all the hands I see around the room and online. So what's the pleasure of the board? Um, is there a motion to take like action as a proposed rule from NOAA or, or anything else? Oh, Dan, you had your hand up before. I'm sorry. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I guess I'm looking for guidance. Is I guess it's been identified that a recreational uh, permit holder in, a, in state waters um, isn't subject to the federal HMS requirements. And so is it the expectation of, of NOAA that we would ban the harvest and then write a caveat within the rule that um, permitted vessel, federally permitted vessels, which we do for a lot of other fisheries, permanent, federally permitted vessels are allowed to bring product in um, subject to federal rules. Is that the end point? Because I'm going to have to go back home and and then my second question is what would be the timing for which we would enact this rule to satisfy the folks at NOAA and ICAT? 
Carol, can you reply to that? Yes, um, it would be it would be wonderful if this body could enact measures that are consistent with what we are proposing. It is a binding recommendation, so at a minimum, we do need to prohibit retention this year and next year. That could be done through doing something like what we're proposing of changing the retention limit to zero and providing some flexibility, which I believe Addendum 5 provides. Um, or it could be that this body decides it's easier to just prohibit retention of short fin mako in state waters. That is a, there are lots of ways to go about doing it, but it, it would be really good if this body could be consistent with the recommendation. You all set, Dan? Great, thanks. Yeah, Tom, one more, one more shot at it then. Mike Luisi, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to clear up what Dan said. I don't think that if you have an HMS, an HMS uh, permit, that even if you're fishing in state waters, it's like every other federal permit. If you have the fed, federal permit, you have to basically, uh, basically do the example of what's the most stringent regulation. So if you have an HMS, you can't fish in state waters. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. If you have an HMS permit, you have to abide by the more restrictive regulation, whether it's federal or state, because there are some states that are more restrictive than us. So that really just affect people that are bycatching a mako while the fish were striped bass or something else in state waters, because if you're really targeting sharks, no matter where you are, you really have to have a federal permit. Mike Luisi, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, based on your request and the recommendation from Carol, I think in the past we've tried to maintain consistency with the federal rulemaking process. And you know, I'm not prepared to go back home and start making changes now. But I think based on the final rule and that and the action that that NOAA Fisheries takes on this. Um, that it would be in the best interest of this board to maintain that consistency. So I'm, I'm happy to um, make a motion, but it it would depend. Yeah, Mike. Let me interrupt you. If that's yeah, okay. you know, yeah. The staff has drafted a motion here, but it's essentially immediate. You know, states would um, implement a zero retention or close their fisheries for short fin mako right now. If you want to modify that to say upon publication of the final rule at NOAA, we'd have to put that in there. So, it, you know, if you're okay with, you know, depends what the, what the will of the group is or what you want to do as the maker of the motion. If you want to close it now or wait until the final rule, that's, we just need to put the final rule language in here if that's what you want to do. Final rule should be out in June, right, Carol? Yeah, she's shaking, shaking her head yes. <clears throat> yeah, I think for the purposes of what we have to do at our at the state level, it would make more sense for for me personally um, to implement that measure after the final rule. So um, it just it'll be an easier process. Um, so I would make I would move to set the retention limit to zero for short fin mako, close the commercial and recreational fisheries for short. Fin short fin mako upon implementation of the NOAA final rule. Is there a second to that? John Clark, thank you. <clears throat> Discussion on this uh, motion. And, you know, a number of states around the table have their regulations linked to the federal regulations. So once the federal regulations go in place, they automatically change. So maybe, you know, the, the timing linking it to the final NOAA rule would make more consistency across our state. So that, that might work. Um, other comments? I saw a couple of hands. Uh, Chris Badsavage. Oh, well, Mike, you, you're the maker of the motion. I'll go back to you then, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to complicate things. I hope, it's, I hope it would be easier for the, for the states around the table to, to implement those measures um, based on the, on the final rule. But if not, uh, I'm certainly welcome to any comments on that. We'll see where this takes us. Uh, Chris Badsavage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can support the motion. Um, I supported uh, 
being consistent with uh, with the federal measures anyways. Um, <clears throat> this gets to uh, the, the point that not every state's administrative process is the same and some states take a little longer than others. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we, could, we could probably have this implemented in North Carolina right around the time the, the final rule comes out. So, uh, but I think it's important to you know, have the consistent measures just to close any potential loopholes that, that could occur um, with not having the same things in place in state waters, even though it might be unlikely to have Mako's in state waters. All you need is somebody to tell an enforcement officer that they caught it in state waters and they have a hard time um, you know, defending that in court. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's why I'm supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan McKiernan, please. Thanks, Bob. Yes, I can support the measure. I just want there to be realistic expectations that each of us is going to have a unique rulemaking timeline. And so by virtue of getting the uh, summary uh, motions from this meeting, I'll be able to serve that upstairs. And um, I'm sure we can get it close to the adoption of the federal rule, but it may not be on the same time frame. That's fair. And I, I think a lot of states will be in that same situation there. The, the administrative timelines to get these in place will vary, but the, the process will be started by this motion. So um, other comments? Yes, Chris. Yeah, I'd just like to repeat the um, having the um, specific language for the implementation of the NOAA rule is going to help. You know, we have a fairly extended uh, process for rule implementation, so um, our stuff ties to federal regs, so this makes it a whole lot easier for us. Great. And Hannah? Yeah, I guess just a clarification question on timeline. So we would still have some time after June to get this put in place. It's not like it'd have to be in place by June. Yeah, I think the idea is as soon as possible, given your administrative process uh, after the, the publication of the final NOAA rule would, would be the goal. I know that's a little bit of a soft goal, but I think it's you know the best we can do and, and with a you know, short timeline and that sort of thing, but everybody's everybody's working in the same direction. Um, uh, Pat Gear. Yeah, Virginia's in favor of this. We will we'll probably be able to do this in July at our meeting, so it'll probably be effective August one. So we're saying so we'll be okay with that. Thanks, Pat. Um, also from Virginia, I've got Lewis Gillingham online. His hand is up. Lewis, do you have uh, something to add beyond Pat's comment? Well, I was going to. That, that's essentially what I was going to say as well. But uh, I know T Tony passed uh, a poll to get an idea of when states could implement that. And I didn't see that in any of the uh, meeting materials, including the supplemental. Would this be a good time to take a look at that? Or what? I'd, I'd like to know the results of that. But I know we, we support the idea of it. It's just the timing, you know, the compliance time. Thank you. Yeah, Lewis, thanks for that suggestion. I think, you know, we're, we're, we've got a whole other agenda item and only about a half an hour to go in this meeting. So rather than go state by state through that poll, we can, we can share that information with the states um, after this meeting. But I think the idea is, is, is pretty clear on the record from folks in the room that will, you know, administrative processes vary up and down the coast, but everybody will try to do the best they can and move as quickly as they can within their process, um, if, if, if that's okay. Um, Mel Bell, you had your hand up earlier, but I assume Chris McDonough made the same comment you would have made. Is that correct? He just said yes. All right. We can't hear you, Mel, but, but Chris verified you're all set, so we're good. Um, all right. Any other comments on this motion? All right. I'm going to take a gamble here. Is there any opposition to the motion that's on the board from folks around the table? I should have asked for caucuses, but it seemed like everybody was on pretty close to the same page here. So I don't see any hands for a caucus or any opposition to this motion. Are there any abstentions to the motion? All right, seeing no hands, the motion passes by consent. So we are all set. And this, oh, uh, yes, Mr. Hamans, go ahead. There's a null down here from Georgia. Pardon me? There's a null vote from Georgia. Oh, Georgia's a null vote. All right, N-U-L-L. Sorry, thank you. We will get that in the record. Georgia is a null vote. Um, excellent. So anything else on Shortfin Mako? Carol, you all set? Yes, thank you very much. Great, thank you. 
All right, we're going to go on to uh, the next agenda item, which is um, talking about CITES and um, a number of sharks that are pre being proposed to be added to Appendix uh, 2. Uh, there's 54 species there, four listed and 50 lookalikes, and Dustin can uh, take us through that uh, and, and give us the background on the issue. It's all you, Dustin. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. In the interest of time and straight bass today, I'll try to move through this quickly. So the Commission was recently made aware of the fact that Panama has proposed the listing of four IUCN listed shark species to CITES Appendix 2. The Ganges and the small tail shark are assessed as critically endangered globally, and the dusky and the gray reef shark are assessed as endangered globally. Uh, the proposal asserts that the regulation of trade in these species is necessary to avoid them from becoming eligible for inclusion in Appendix 1 in the near future. I'll get into what the, each of the appendices mean in a little bit. So the proposal also includes the remaining members of the Carcharinidae family, which includes 50 species. Um, and the justification is provided that the fins and meat of these four species are very difficult to differentiate from the other 50 species in the family, many of which are already classified under IUCN as endangered as well. The proposal elaborates that customs enforcement capacity varies by country, and visual inspection is often the only tool available at their, disposable, at dis at their disposal for some countries. So to ensure none of the four proposed species slip through undetected, they propose all 50 lookalike species be included in Appendix 2, which identification experts and educators say can be visually uh, differentiated from other species that would not fall under CITES Appendix 1 and 2 listing. As a reminder, uh, CITES Appendix 2 listing still allows for the international trade of that species so long as the exporter is granted an export permit or a re-export certificate. Uh, permits or certificates are only to be granted if the relevant authorities are satisfied that certain conditions are met. Above all, uh, that trade will not be detrimental to the survival of the species in the wild. So often, CITES Appendix 2 listed species are not necessarily threatened uh, with immediate extinction, but uh, increased trade may bring them into uh, that category, which would fall under Appendix 1, a species that is threatened with extinction. So of the 54 proposed species, 12 of the species are currently managed by the Commission, and they're listed up here on the screen uh, by group as well. So blue bull, black tip, lemon, fine tooth, Atlantic sharp nose, and black nose sharks are all currently quota managed species managed by the Commission within the Coastal Sharks FMP. And small tail, dusky, Caribbean reef, big nose, and Galapagos sharks are prohibited species within the Commission's FMP. For your reference, I've also provided stock status by species. Uh, so bluefish, or sorry, <laughs> excuse me, blue sharks, Atlantic black tip sharks, uh, Atlantic sharp nose, and fine tooth sharks are assessed to be not overfished, nor was overfishing occurring during the last assessment got my species confused there. I'm also the FMP coordinator for bluefish. Black nose and dusky sharks are overfished and experiencing overfishing as of the latest stock assessment. And the remaining six species, uh, their stock statuses are just unknown at this point. I'll close with a quick snapshot of commercial landings in pounds for the seven species that are quota managed. And the fisheries for blue, bull, lemon, fine tooth, and black nose sharks have been quite small in the five of the most recent years for which we have data for. And black tip and Atlantic sharp nose shark harvest is between the 100,000 and 300,000 pound um, range from year to year. So now that you have been briefed on this issue, the question for the board's consideration is if the commission should comment on this proposal to add 54 shark species to CITES Appendix 2, 
Uh, Den, Deb Hahn from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies originally brought this to ASMFC's and to state agencies' attention to see if the commission would like to provide comment on the draft proposal. And they are looking for comment uh, in a relatively fast turnaround, uh, hopefully by the end of next week. Um, so it, if it is the will of the board here to provide, have the commission provide comment, that would be a tasking to the policy board to consider this issue again tomorrow. And we do have a draft motion prepared, but it might be helpful for the board to discuss some uh, justification or some of the content that they'd like to be included in a letter if such a letter is desired to be written. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dustin. Let's start with questions or comments on, on Dustin's presentation and, um, you know, the CITES process is something ASMSC kind of dabbles in it from time to time and, and you know, process-wise I get it's not super familiar to all of us, but, you know, the, the question is, you know, do we want to send a letter uh, commenting on this and if we do, what do you want the letter to say? Um, are we in favor or in opposition? If we're in opposition, why? Uh, what, what justification do we want to provide in that? So with that, questions and comments? John Clark. Yeah, I just had a question, Bob. Um, how much of the shark landed here would be, is exported or would be, you know, have some of these limits put on it? That's a good question. I wish I was prepared for that question. I'd have to get back to you on that. I can just follow up. I mean, this is what would be covered, right? It's it's bans the export of this shark. So if none of it's being exported, it's not really a problem here. Yeah, that, that's correct. It would only be additional paperwork um, for exports. And so I, I definitely can get back to you on that. And I'm also wondering, I'm not sure if Carol, with more experience working with coastal sharks, might have an idea. Sorry to put you on the spot, Carol. If you don't have an answer, that's completely fine. But Carol, before you answer real quick, John, this doesn't ban the exports. It just creates a whole boatload of paperwork associated with, with pulling right. that Right. No, out. I get that, yeah. Bob, okay. but I'm just one, you know, I mean, if, if it's one of those things where we're not doing this anyhow, I don't have any problem with, you know, joining CITES on. All right. Fair enough. Carol, do you, do you have any numbers on export in, or, or product that stays domestic? I am opening up our SAFE report to find out the numbers. Um, it is not just additional paperwork for the, the dealers. It's actually a lot of paperwork for the dealers. Um, and if I remember correctly, there are only certain ports that they can import and export product from. So this includes any product from the high seas. It then goes through the easy, which I think for most of the coastal sharks probably is not um, an issue, but let me get back to you. I'm, I'm looking at opening the safe report now. I'll get back to you in a minute. Great. Thanks. Other questions while Carol is, uh, picking through her files. I've got, um, two hands online. Uh, Roy Miller, go ahead, please. Thank you, Bob. Uh, just a quick question. Since this proposal includes members of the family Parcharinidae. Um, the obvious question is some other families are apparently not included, such as the hammerhead family, Sparinidae, um, sand tiger shark family. Is it, are we going to see more of this in the future? Or are they going to include the other shark species that might already be in the thin trade? such as the hammerhead. Thanks. Uh, great question, Roy. Uh, there has been a uh, final uh, or a proposed rule um, that's gone through the Federal Register of other shark species that have been proposed as well. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife tends to categorize the listing of species in three different levels. Uh, level A being most likely that US, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife is going to put forward a recommendation for uh, Appendix 2 listing or Appendix 1 listing. No shark species made it into row A or Category A. 
Uh, there were, however, six species of uh, hammerhead sharks that could potentially, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife is undecided at this time. They, they could forward a recommendation. Um, and none of those six, to my understanding, are within the species that the commission manages. Um, but in category C, I think environmental NGOs have pretty much proposed all sharks be listed. Um, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has indicated that they're unlikely to forward that as a recommendation unless there's greater amounts of data or support for, for those listings. Great. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah, I, you know, Roy, I guess to add to what Dustin said, I think the international concern and, and um, interest in shark fin trade and other things, probably the short answer to your question is yes, the more of these things are going to be proposed in the near future would be my, my guess. Um, Mel Bell. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, John kind of hit on it. Is, is I don't really have a clear picture on, uh, and that's what Carol was looking for, I guess, on how much actually gets exported. It, you know, and I know that's not something we track at the state level. We basically just deal with the initial wholesale dealer. But I was wondering, and Carol mentioned that there was um, significant, um, I guess, uh, paperwork associated with this for the dealers. But is there also a requirement for the states? Um, to basically be involved in permitting oversight or something. So beyond just the dealers, do the, do the states get uh, kind of dragged into the administrative process of this? Um, I think Carol's going to help us with this, and she may have also opened the safe report and help with uh, John Clark's question from earlier. I, I will try to answer all the questions that have come up. Um, in terms of shark exports the u.s doesn't export a lot we do not have data by species the u.s census data does does shark fins shark fresh shark frozen um in 20 well 2010 for example we had 36 metric tons of fin exports now it's down to three metric tons in 2020 um, fresh exports were 222 me metric tons of shark exports, and in 2020 it was 427. So that one went up. And frozen exports um, went from 244 in 2010 to 109 in 2020. And also keep in mind, this is not just the Atlantic, this is the entire U U.S. exports. So. There's not a, a lot compared to some of our species, but it does seem to be increasing on the, the fresh exports. There was a, a question about hammerhead sharks. Hammerhead sharks, great, smooth, and scalloped, are already listed on Appendix 2. The proposal that has come forward is to list all the rest of the hammerhead species, and that includes, for our purposes, bonnethead sharks. Um, whether or not they should be listed, and the whole purpose there is fin look-alike. All of this is people saying that the fins of the sharks look alike, and it's too difficult for enforcement to, to monitor them. In terms of the paperwork, I don't know specifically if the states would be involved. I think they would be. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service is the one who issues all the permits. They do reach out to us when they get applications for us to check our data. I am assuming, though I don't know for sure, that they would also reach out to the states to see if there's state data that would be applicable to making their decision on whether to issue the permit. Great. Thanks, Carol. That's helpful on the import-export for sure. Uh, Dan McKiernan. Yeah, just a point of clarification, Bob. Uh, I've been um, copied on two letters from Massachusetts industry interests about listing, uh, possible listing of spiny dogfish and winter skate. Is this a separate issue that we're going to discuss either under other business or at, by the policy board? Yeah. Um, the idea was see where this goes specific to these 54 species, recommendation to the policy board. During the policy board, we were going to bring up spiny dogfish, as you recommended, and American eel is back. 
um, on the or being proposed to be listed in Appendix 2. Again, we've commented on that multiple times. So we're going to tackle both of those tomorrow during policy board. All right, thanks. Um, any other comments on what to do with this letter? Um, I do have uh, Deborah Hahn from uh, American or Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency. She's kind of the CITES expert, so she might be able to help us out. So I'm going to go to Deb and um, hear her comment, and hopefully she can clarify some of these questions. Deb, are you available? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Can you hear me? Yep, sound great. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks, everyone. Yeah, I was talking with Tony earlier this week and had shared some emails with Dustin, so I thought I'd join in today just in case. And um, yeah, so you've got a couple things, different things going on here. You've got a proposal from the country of Panama for the species that you just heard about. And then you have a federal register notice process where the Fish and Wildlife Service goes out to the public and says, what do you think we should um, consider listing, delisting, uplisting, whatever it is within the CITES appendices. And that's where these other species of sharks and rays will come in in your discussions tomorrow. Um, because they are in the undecided category within the Federal Register Notice, um, if you do have any concerns, it, it, I'm not as familiar with sharks um, export, but it sounds like there's not a lot. But if there are concerns, um, it would be great to, to share those just so that data and that information is in the public record and Fish and Wildlife Service can take that into account when they make their decisions. Um, it is likely with sharks that, I mean, I, I kind of feel like we're destined to have them all listed eventually. And that kind of the example of the Panama proposal where you have a whole suite of sharks and then a whole nother, you know, 40 or more that are listed for look-alike issues. So um, again, as you guys noted, Appendix 2 does not ban international trade. It does add a burden to um, folks who are applying to move species internationally. Um, from a state perspective, it just sort of depends. So some of our states that export a lot of Appendix 2 species or support that export, like in Bobcat, have to do tagging have to do reporting every five years. For these sharks, it should not be that burdensome. You may get a question from Fish and Wildlife every now and again about an export and information on your laws to make sure, and regulations to make sure that that export, um, one of the things they do is they, one, they make sure it was legally taken within the state regulations. And then also um, they may ask for data over time to try to determine whether the tank is sustainable. So that's where the burden can come in, but I don't believe it would be a lot and I don't believe it would be regular communication um, on that. As for American eel, it is in the unlikely category within the Federal Register Notice. Um, it would be great just to have some public record comments from all of you on that, um, just so they're there but it is highly unlikely that there will be anything moving forward on American Eel this year. Um, so I'll stop there and you can answer other comments if needed. Great, thanks Deb for the comments, very helpful and, and we'll see if there's questions directed at you. I've got one more member at the table and I've got one member of the uh, public with his hand up and I'll go to the table, um, Spud Woodward, and then we'll go to the member of the public. Um, thanks Bob. <clears throat> Question for Carol: are, are we, where are we at in terms of harvesting along the Atlantic coast uh, sharks pursuant to the quotas? Are we, are we hitting the quotas? Are we chronically har under harvesting? What's what's the general trend? We are so far below the quota of all of these species. Well, that that's, I guess th this is my. My comment on this is, you know, in the South Atlantic, and I assume this is going to become a problem farther north, is shark depredation is, is an increasingly annoying problem. It's, it's leading to increasing fishing mortality, you know, when, when fish have to be discarded and then replaced by a whole fish that can be legally landed. Uh, so my question is, is this, is this going to further disincentivize commercial harvest? And lead to further depression of, of domestic landings because you know a lot of folks 
right or wrong perceive that you know one of the solutions to the shark depredation is to is to max out the allowable removals you know whether it be recreational but primarily commercial so i guess my question is 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 this going to be a disincentive that may continue to dampen down domestic landings is that rhetorical spot are you directing at that someone <laughs> no i'd like somebody to give me at least a perspective on it because i mean you know just as a lay person that's not involved the more complicated you make things Sometimes that's just another disincentive for people to do it. So I'm just curious if it fits enough of a disincentive that it will affect people's willingness to stay in the shark fishery, to be active in the shark fishery, that kind of thing. Carol, you took your mask off like you want to respond, or you're willing to respond. I don't know if you want to respond. Do you have a response to that? I can tell you what we've been hearing. Um, we. I don't remember when time passes by. We recently released our shark fishery review called Share. Carol, sorry to interrupt, but can you bring your microphone closer? Sorry. Yeah. No, you're, you're being polite looking at Spud, but you're, you're away from yes, the microphone. Yes, and I, I, I apologize. Um, we recently released our shark fishery review. It was a draft document. We're still working on the final. What we found is that the commercial shark fishery overall is not doing well number of permits are decreasing, the trend in the retention of sharks meeting the quotas is going down, the number of active permit holders is going down. A lot of this happened after hammerhead sharks were listed. Dealers have reported difficulty getting the permit or even having the contacts in which to make the sales if they happen to get a fish and wildlife permit to export hammerhead sharks. So in short, what I am hearing is the fishermen and dealers are telling us that yes, at least listing hammerhead and silky sharks and the other sharks that have recently been listed as appendix two has been a disincentive for people to come into the fishery. Thanks, Carol. Um, so I've, as I said, I have one hand in the public, then we can come back and, and talk about whether we should send a letter or not. So with that, uh, John Whiteside, just um, pretty quickly, we're starting to run a little bit late on time here. So if you could make your comment quickly, that'd be great. Yes, good morning. Um, and this is regarding uh, dogfish, uh, uh, spiny dogfish and winter skate. It's tied into what you're saying, so I'm not sure whether I should comment now or you want me to wait on that, and I'll I'll hold if you want. Yeah, let's wait on that until tomorrow's policy board meeting, if you're okay with that, John. I am, as long as that's also going to be the last uh, comments that would be taken before a you know a decision on sending a letter or not, because that's that's what this is all about. So. Yeah, the, well, the decision on the, the shark letter that we're talking about now is an independent decision from the spiny dogfish letter. So it'll be two different Excellent. discussions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so with that, you know, as I mentioned, we, we've commented on eels. This isn't an eel board meeting, but we have commented on eels as a commission that said, you know, we don't support listing in Appendix 2 because ASMFC is very, uh, and the states are very stringent. Uh, management program, very restrictive quotas, very effective management. The import and export is, is highly controlled on American eels, especially elvers, or, or export, not the import. Export of elvers is highly controlled through a few control points, et cetera, et cetera. Does this group want to say something similar to that about sharks? In other words, you know, very uh, conservative management program in the United States, effective shark finning, um, enforcement and monitoring and that sort of thing, if folks feel that way. Um, is that kind of the idea that folks want to um, put into a letter or the other way, which is, does this board support the listing in Appendix 2? I don't, you know, it's really up to the group, but, but you know, I just want to give everyone perspective on what this group has said, what the commission has said about American Eel in the past. So with that, any thoughts or comments on, on where we go from here? I sense not a strong feeling around the room. Um, anyone, you know, do do I guess just general direction, letter letter 
to highlight the concerns that the commission has or a letter to highlight support that the commission has any any direction at all would be great tom i just have very difficulty that we're putting things on lists just because they can't basically enforce what the laws are, are going so sooner or later we'll be basically putting a lot more sharks and everything else on these lists and i over the years i've been here a long time i notice we never go back the other way i'm still struggling with the bluefin tuna allocation that was made 30 years ago on the recreational sector so i have a problem i i think we i would support the letter because i just think it's so much paperwork and everything else involved that we uh, we don't need at this time and and i'll leave it at that thanks tom uh mel bell you have a comment yeah thanks bob uh you know we expressed a number of concerns in all of this and i just felt like maybe it would be good to at least get those on paper of course we're i guess we're lateraling this to the policy board for tomorrow but and so i'm not sure exactly what to say but it's something somehow we could capture some of our concerns at least and have them on record um, but uh that, so i would be in favor of of saying something but i guess we don't have to decide that right now that would go to the policy board tomorrow right yeah that'd be correct we'll go to policy board tomorrow mel um, I guess, yeah, Rick, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I don't have a specific position on this, but I have served in a previous role as uh, co-chair of the International Relations Committee for the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, have worked closely with Deb Hahn for the last several years. Um, and just to give some context, Frequently, the states have chosen to weigh in on these issues uh, in the context of uh, acknowledging the vital role that sustainable use plays in conserving our natural resources, and that that ought to be taken into consideration on these listing decisions. And as a result, this body might choose to follow that sort of lead uh, of expressing the importance of su sustainable use in advancing the conservation of shark species. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate that comment. Others around the table? You know, the other option is individual states can comment on their own, and the commission doesn't have to comment if, if, that's, if there's a difference of opinion around the table. But let me, let me, oh, go ahead, Dan, please. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I would be in favor of the commission writing a letter on behalf of the member states. And Dan, that letter would express concern with listing um, in the, these 54 species in Appendix 2? Yes. Great. So we, we at staff will try to come up with a couple of bullets to, to capture this conversation and maybe, you know, reference some of the previous letters that we've sent on, con on similar things and get those maybe up on a slide for uh, the policy board tomorrow, if that works for everybody. But go the other way. Is there any opposition to forwarding that to the policy board as a, as a recommendation? All right. We'll do that. Uh, we have one more agenda item on an advisory panel nomination. Tina, are you available for that? I am. Thank you. Uh, I offer for the board's consideration uh, the nomination of Thomas Newman, an inshore gill netter from North Carolina. Thomas replaces Dewey Hemolite, who served on the AP for many years, and we appreciate Dewey's contributions to the management program. I offer this for your consideration and approval. Thank you, Tina. Is there a nomination? Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to nominate Thomas Newman to the Coastal Sharks Advisory Panel from North Carolina. Seconded by Pat Gear. Any opposition to this addition to the Coastal Shark Advisory Panel? All right, seeing none, Thomas Newman is the newest member of the AP. Um, any other uh, topics or other business to come before the Coastal Shark Management Board today? All right, seeing none, we stand adjourned and we'll start, um, I guess we have a little meeting in Straight Bass this afternoon. We'll start that at 1130.